In 1975, the realistic but modest goal of the Dallas Cowboys was a 10th straight winning season. The team numbered 12 rookies on their 43-man roster. Gone were Lilly, Garrison, Green, Hayes, Nylon, Hill, and Manders, men who had led Dallas to the playoffs in eight of the last nine seasons. Even with a lineup depleted in proven talent and experience, the Cowboys held a whole card in poker-faced Tom Landry. A player once said, you never win or lose to the Cowboys, you win or lose to Tom Landry. But Landry believes victory depends on good people, a commodity the Cowboys had in abundance. I think the thing that makes you successful is the people that make up your football team. I don't care whether you draft them or you trade them or what you do. Uh, this year we have a young football team in many respects. We have a lot of young rookies who have a lot of enthusiasm. They hit hard and uh, they express enthusiasm. It becomes contagious and our veterans will pick it up. And this is a reason that we're a little different this year than we've been in the past. The young Cowboys desperately needed a few early season victories to gain their sea legs for the championship chase. Game one pitted them against the Rams, a team that was like an old dog trying to keep up with a pack of pups. And if you're chasing cars or championships, it's a good way to get run over. The crackling doomsday defense allowed Los Angeles to cross midfield just once as Dallas won an easy 18-7 victory and prompted 34-year-old Leroy Jordan to say, I felt like the headmaster at a Boy Scout jamboree. To combat inexperience, Tom Landry devised the unexpected for the unsuspecting St. Louis Cardinals in the second week. A 97-yard touchdown by rookie linebacker Thomas Henderson spurred Dallas to a 37-31 triumph. Two solid wins over championship contenders mushroomed into three in a row against the Detroit Lions. The quick strike offense came through with flying colors and rolled up 36 points. The big hip Doomsday defense ran relays into the Detroit backfield and sacked Lion quarterbacks an incredible 11 times. The blending of a hearty nucleus of veterans with a liberal sprinkling of youth produced three straight impressive victories and a climate of contagious enthusiasm that was best expressed by safety Charlie Waters. That emotional factor that the rookies bring into the game, uh, the unpredictable thing that they have, I knew that if we had that going for us, the determination, the intensity, that we can beat anybody. The youth, the mix of the youth and the age on our team is it's just been super. Our organization, they're smart. They know what they're doing. Smart organization was borne out by the special teams. The end result of Mitch Hupp's towering punts was a hard lick by Benny Barnes, Bob Bruni, Pat Donovan, Kyle Davis, and Calvin Peterson. For some, the unit was a stepping stone before graduate work with the front line defense. The Cowboys used situation substitutions, a strategy that shuttled in fresh legs and took advantage of number one draft choice Randy White's ability to rush the passer. Disguised at linebacker, tackle, or end in the complex scheme of a doomsday defense, White became a bruising component in the NFC's third-ranked defense.
Early in 1975, their flex defense was like the little girl with the curl. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. The flex was geared for a hitter like Cliff Harris, who deftly slipped from deep safety to the point of attack to close down sweeps. On the line, number 75, Jethro Pugh assumed the leadership burden from Bob Lilly. And with the help of six foot nine Ed Too Tall Jones, a runner couldn't see the forest for the trees. As a pass rusher, Too Tall and his punishing partner Harvey Martin helped Dallas dust off quarterbacks 41 times. The swarming charge of tackles, Larry Cole, Jethro Pugh, and Bill Gregory added up to big hits and fumbles, a category that ranked the Cowboys second best in the NFL. Rookie Randy Hughes, number 42, had a nose for the ball. Used to winning at Oklahoma, the rangy safety fit into the secondary like a final piece in a puzzle. By the end of 1975, Doomsday gained an all-pro in Cliff Harris and lost its Jekyll and Hyde style. One thing it retained was enthusiasm, a trait dear to the heart of Leroy Jordan. I think the veterans uh, have their own enthusiasm. I think that's one of my assets as far as, uh, you know, I really like to cheerlead. I like to cheer these guys on because I like to see people do things well. The zest for the game spilled over from veterans D.D. Lewis, Mel Renfro, Mark Washington, and Dave Edwards to the rookies and to place kicker Tony Frisch. There was a common bond, a common cause, a third Super Bowl appearance for the Dallas Cowboys. What Dallas gained in spirit was thought to be offset by a void at running back. But even here, there was a musketeer feeling of all for one and one for all. Gone was Calvin Hill's 1,000 yards, but Robert Newhouse added 930 yards of his own. Newhouse's partner was acquired for not even the waiver price just two days before the first game. But in Preston Pearson, the Cowboys found the key that unlocked the season. Charles Young and Doug Dennison added depth and muscle to the backfield. And by year's end, a supposed weakness became a strength. And Dallas led the NFC in Russia. Quarterback Roger Staubach was the hub around which everything and everybody revolved. Roger's reckless style made him a high-risk quarterback, someone who sacrificed his body for six points. Realizing that a severe injury to Staubach would rob their chances for the playoffs, the imaginative Landry reincarnated a formation that made Roger less vulnerable to the pass rush. Used part of a season by the 49ers over a decade ago, the shotgun became a staple in the cowboy attack. The formation gave Staubach an excellent sight line into the secondary and afforded him a precious extra second to size up the defense and seize the opportunity to pass or run. Landry embellished the shotgun with many artistic frills, but it was primarily a passing formation made for Roger Starbuck. The biggest advantage of the shotgun is, is uh, getting back deep in a shorter period of time and the ability to see defenses for a longer period of time. Uh, you take, you put more burden on the rush. You're, you're back deeper, and the other thing is for a quarterback, as far as myself, more mobility. I can move around more because uh, I'm back there quicker. 
under the gun Starbucks pinpoint passing enabled him to complete 57% of his passes. And in his greatest season, the Dallas Cowboys gained the most yards in the NFC. The spread formation quickly breached the heart of a secondary for tight ends Billy Joe Dupree and number 84 Gene Fugit. Fugit's versatility made him a valuable swing man who also played wide receiver, a position with little depth but big explosion. Number 83, Golden Richards was the fastest cowboy a quarter horse whose speed opened up the field and drew double coverage away from the patterned precision of Drew Pearson, the team's leading receiver. In the championship season, Pearson gained more than 800 yards and caught eight touchdown passes. Number 88 was a former quarterback and thus understands the subtleties of a passing attack the importance of down and distance, and the timing between quarterback and receiver. While Pearson probed and poked at defenses like a good counterpuncher, Golden Richards averaged more than 21 yards a catch and had the ability to stretch and snap secondaries at their limits. Richards mastered the shorter patterns, routes that required concentration, agility, and the coordination between hand and eye. Tom Landry's playbook has traditionally been as thick as the Encyclopedia Britannica. In the expansion years, these varied formations and shifts were Christmas ornaments employed to camouflage weakness but for the last 10 years, they have made the Cowboys winners and the hardest team to prepare for in pro football. For years, the Cowboys were exciting but unloved. Now that they were underdogs instead of odds-on favorites, their mind-boggling style captured everyone's fancy. Each week, they pulled out games and plays like magicians grabbing rabbits out of a hat. Their games were carnivals, where anything could happen and usually did. Opposing coaches and critics ridicule the plays as high school or sandlot, but by week 13, they helped the Cowboys move to within one victory of the playoffs. For Tom Landry, a season of little expectation climaxed with visions of a wild card berth. In his path stood some old enemies, the Redskins and George Allen. Well, the Redskin-Cowboy rivalry is intense because the Cowboys had this division to themselves. They had a cakewalk every year. They won it every year, eight consecutive years. So we come in and we destroy their, uh, their power. We knocked them off. And any time any club comes in and upsets your equilibrium, then uh, there's going to be a rivalry. A flat start put Dallas in a 10-0 hole until Golden Richards dug them out with a 57-yard catch and carry. The Cowboys gained a 14-10 lead 
when Starbuck, on a well-conceived quarterback draw, traded a brutal shot to his aching ribs for a touchdown. Last season, when Starbuck was forced out of the game, the Redskins fell victim to Clint Longley's miracle on Thanksgiving. One year later, it was the doomsday defense and Cliff Harris's helmet that drove a stake into their offense. The 31-10 route of Washington was capped by a final irony. Safety Charlie Waters, so often battered in Redskin victories, scored the climatic touchdown that left George Allen out of the playoff cold for the first time in five years. Nineteen seventy-five was a year the Dallas Cowboys came full circle. After years of being champions, they were Cinderellas. To reach the Super Bowl, they had to win two away games. But history was on their side, for the Cowboys had not lost in the first round of the playoffs since 1969. In Minnesota, Tom Landry's team was on the brink of elimination, even though they had outfought and outfought the Vikings for 58 minutes. Trailing 14 to 10, 80 yards stood between Dallas and victory. Rayfield Wright drove number 81, Carl Eller, from Bloomington to Minneapolis as Starbuck desperately sought and found Drew Pearson. Pearson's catch moved the Cowboys to midfield with just 24 seconds remaining. The trusty shotgun seemed no match for the Viking zone, which denied the bomb but could not hold back America. In one magic moment, Drew Pearson transformed defeat into victory. Roger Starbuck described it as a Hail Mary play. The controversy over Pearson's touchdown obscured the fact that Dallas clearly dominated Minnesota and deserved to win. Many chalked their victory up to luck. Surely they said the miracles would dry up against the imposing Los Angeles Rams, a team that had scored a decisive playoff victory over the Cardinals. One week later at the Coliseum, the opinions were unanimous. The Rams were bound to win. Is there any question? I mean, is there any question on who's going to win? Would I be dressed like this if there was a doubt in my mind as to who's going to win? We're going to go to the Super Bowl. Tom Landry's defensive strategy was simple. Stop Larry McCutcheon. McCutcheon, who gained 237 yards against St. Louis, was flat out crushed and held to 10 yards on 11 carries. With McCutcheon eliminated, the over-eager front four towed out and stampeded into quarterback Ron Jaworski. The question still remained whether Landry's offense could budge the NFC's number one defense. The interior line of Fitzgerald, Nye, and Lawless held firm in the middle, while Rayfield Wright drove out Jack Youngblood and Ralph Neely kicked out Fred Dreyer. The day belonged to 30-year-old Preston Pearson the former basketball player at Illinois, who once blocked a skyhook by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The former Steeler was the only cowboy ever to play for another NFL team, and the man Roger Starbuck called the key to our season.
Pearson caught three touchdown passes and caused the fall of the Ram Empire in its own Coliseum. A day that began with shouting, ended in silence, as the Cowboys unhinged, then dismantled a defense that had yielded under 10 points a game during the 1975 season. This was a day of absolute victory. The defense held the Rams to seven points, while the offense rolled up 37 of their own. But more than that, it was a tribute to Tom Landry and the bold strategies called Sandlot or worse. The Dallas Cowboys laid waste to the cynics and skeptics. They were the NFC champions. They were going to the Super Bowl. Number one! Super Sunday dawned bright and sunny. For the Dallas Cowboys, it was another day of being underdogs. After so much accomplished, they would have been forgiven for falling flat on their helmets. Instead, they played dead even with the world champion Pittsburgh Steelers and made the 10th Super Bowl the most exciting and competitive ever. Dallas displayed their signature offense, a versatile and varied attack. Unlike so many teams before them, they did not dull out this game. Their philosophy was as clear as a kid's letter from camp. Having fun, happy to be here. The defense which held Chuck Foreman and Lawrence McCutcheon to under 100 yards in the playoffs limited Franco Harris to 82 on 27 attempts. The Cowboys led for most of the game, but the Pittsburgh Steelers and graceful Lynn Swan were the better team at the end. Later, Swan said, after my touchdown, we all expected them to give up. They never did. The die-hard Cowboys battled to the final second when time and the Steelers combined to defeat them 21 to 17. Painful as it was to lose the biggest game of the season, everyone agreed there were no losers in Super Bowl X. Certainly not the Dallas Cowboys, who re-established themselves as champions and continued a streak of excellence that has produced 10 straight winning seasons and nine playoff appearances in 10 years. The best is yet to come, for this is a young team, a team with spirit and character, a team that wins with a smile. <laughs>